and very happy to be here to talk about using the IR vision depalletizing process. Uh, depalletizing uh, is a uh, pretty frequently uh, performed task in a robotic automation environment, and IR vision or machine vision in general is one of the great enablers of this process, and uh, I hope that we give you some uh, hints as to how to use our very powerful tool to do vision-guided depalletizing in the future and maybe give you, give you some ideas about how you can use this in uh, your maybe existing depalletizing operations. I'm going to start out with a brief overview and a little bit of fundamentals, the concepts of depalletizing and how our IR vision depalletizing process works. First of all, depalletizing is one of the many IR vision processes in the uh, IR vision uh, tool set. And I want to just review with you, if you are not uh, fully familiar with how IR vision works, the IR vision process in general is a, the top level uh, tool that enables a guidance or an inspection uh, application through IR Vision. Of course, IR Vision resides on every uh, FANUC robot controller, and uh, all we need to do is add the appropriate components, hardware components for the vision task, and then get you started with using IR Vision for your uh, for your systems. So it is one of these many valuable uh, IR Vision processes, and. Um, I think that if you're not familiar with depalletizing, I hope that you get an idea that you can use it for things beyond just depalletizing, and that's something I'm going to focus on today. So what is the depalletizing process in general? It's very similar to 2D vision. If you, use, if you have used simple 2D vision guidance to look for, to find a part uh, on a, uh, a, for picking or placing in X, Y, and uh, roll or uh, a rotation. Uh, the 2D vision process is uh, very much like the depalletizing process, except that the depalletizing vision process provides the height of the part. Now, a lot of machine vision vendors in the and a lot of people in the machine vision community actually refer to this as 2.5D guidance, meaning that we get all of the 2D information, the X, Y, and R information from the part, along with this Z-axis offset. We have two general configurations, as we do with um, many of our processes. We are able to do depalletizing with, in a fixed frame offset with a fixed camera. And we can also do the uh, depalletizing process, get, providing a fixed frame offset for PIC with a robot-mounted camera. It goes without saying, I think, from the definition or from the title of the process itself, that this can be used to a to great advantage when you're unloading stacked uh, and identical objects. It also can be used, though, where the height of a known object needs, known object needs to be uh, discovered, uh, or in, 2D, in any 2D guidance application where you know the height of the part, but you need to change it at runtime. And we'll talk about those a little bit later as we go on. Again, the thing I want to take away, I want you to take away from our introduction here to the uh, process concepts is that. We have a, a, a very descriptive name for this process called depalletizing, but it is useful in a wide variety of applications, and I want you to get an idea of how it works so that you can maybe imagine how it can be useful for you uh, in enhancing uh, machine vision uh, and IR vision for your uh, guidance applications. So how does it work? Uh, I think it's pretty simple to understand, but I'm going to go through a, a quick overview of uh, actually uh, what, how we derive the height from scale, and I use the word inferring height from scale because it's not a direct measurement, it's an inference based on the scaling of a geometric pattern match tool. So the first thing is that we will use the geometric pattern match scale result to understand the scaling of the object in the view. And I think if you've used 2D guidance or even any uh, of our applications where you use a geometric pattern, you know that you can that you get a scaling result from that geometric pattern. It is mathematically derived uh, based on the uh, match of the uh, edge components of the, the geometric pattern to the target image. And 
really the uh, geometric pattern, given that you have good edges and a good and a well-trained pattern, is a very ac provides a very accurate scale result. What do we do though? We can use the lens imaging angle to determine where the object is in space based on size. What happens is, based because of the uh, parallax of the lens and the imaging angle of the lens, objects just simply, due to the opti optics, appear larger when they're moved closer to a lens, and uh, conversely, they appear smaller when they're moved farther away from a lens. So as we can see here in the little graphic, uh, we have an original object that might have been uh, taut, as we saw in the earlier slide, at 100%. Uh, that was the taut scaling of that object. As that same object, again, not changing the objects, not cha it's an identical object, but as that same object moves closer to the camera, it will increase in scale. For example, if it gets closer to the camera a certain amount, it may report 150% scale relative to its original trained, uh, trained uh, features at its original trained position. So we have we know that we can get the scaling from the GPM. We know that we can that we get different sizes of the object as the part moves around in space uh, perpendicular to the camera field of view. The next step and the and it is easy to understand is that we're going to take the movement and calibrate the z height relative to the image scaling factor. Uh, very basically, we take known scales at the extent of the movement, the lowest portion, the lowest place we expect to see the object and the highest place we expect to see the object. And then by knowing known ca camera parameters from accurate calibration, and of course the calibration returns us that imaging angle, uh, we can make up a height to scale relationship, which is geometric and it's based on that image angle and actually can be calculated with very reasonable precision. Um, in some cases, depending on the size of the field of view and the uh, image angle of the lens, uh, this type of analysis is more accurate than some of the standard 3D, uh, 3D imaging systems that you see on the market, including some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, FANUC specialized, uh, specialized components. There are some caveats, though, and we're going to go into those as we uh, get along in our discussion. So what I'd like to do is give you a quick example of how we uh, approach uh, this scaling and discover the scale of the objects uh, using IR vision. And I'm going to do that uh, using uh, the FANUC RoboGuide product. If you're not familiar with RoboGuide, uh, I hope that you uh, uh, take a look at this. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, all of the details of RoboGuide, but RoboGuide is FANUC's uh, fully functional simulation program that allows us to simulate not only robot movement and the movement of uh, auxiliary components, but also allows us to simulate all of the IR vision functions, right down to placing cameras, taking, image, taking simulated images, and picking simulated parts. It's an extremely powerful tool. You can literally uh, uh, prototype your entire application right at your desk using uh, this uh, RoboGuide tool. So let me start out here. Uh, I'll just describe what I have in uh, in in my RoboGuide cell. Uh, we have a, uh, of course, a robot uh, conveyor that'll be the offload conveyor for our parts. Um, uh, a pick tool uh, that's kind of just a generic tool. Uh, we don't we're not controlling or, or determining any uh, vacuum or uh, force sensing on this tool. Uh, but of course, those types of things could be simulated. Up here in the, at the top, I'm not sure if you can see my small cursor, there we go. Uh, I have a camera. It's a little bit hard to see, but we'll see that a little more when we uh, start to take the images. I also have a robot-mounted camera. Um, we use that for a couple of things, and I'll, I'll refer to those uh, as we get along in our discussion. And then just a virtual palette with a, a bunch of objects on that palette. I'm going to start by uh, getting rid of those objects. Um, and uh, just for our purposes of discussion right now, I'm going to hide uh, hide those objects or take them off the palette and uh, put up put up on the palette a very simple cylinder to take an image of. And uh, let's go to um, 
our IR vision setup. And uh, I'll uh, create a new IR vision process. For, for now, let's just do this in a 2D single view vision product. I'm not going to get into depalletizing yet. I'd like to describe for you in, uh, in a familiar process how this uh, scaling works using a geometric pattern match tool. So we'll make a new process, create a new process called cylinder scaling. Uh, just a 2D, simple 2D process. I have a camera calibration already set up for that overhead camera. And um, we'll select that camera. Oh, and uh, let me go back to the uh, uh, RoboGuide, uh, uh, the RoboGuide uh, screen. I want to uh, show you that the um, uh, the user frame has already been set, and it's the we've created a user frame off of the corner of the palette at the top of the palette. So as I discuss that, as I discuss all of our processing here today, I'll be referencing user frame one, which is in this case the the, the palette. That's, of course, up to your application, and uh, certainly you could use a, uh, a world user frame or another uh, user frame as appropriate for the application. But that's what we're using today for this particular demonstration. So I'll select Offset Frame 1 as my user frame for this vision process, and let's move directly to a GPM, Geometric Pattern Match Locator Tool. The exercise I'm going to do for you is to train the tool. Uh, around this object, and let's mask some of the uh, features that are not going to be of interest to our processing. It's an important step, of course, in training a GPM. If you have features that uh, are in, either inconsistent from image to image or features that are part of the background, it's critical that you mask them out so that they don't get included in the location portion of your process. So with that, I have created a, uh, a GPM that finds that, uh, finds that cylinder, the top of that cylinder. With a little bit of adjustment, we probably know, if you've, if you've worked with this tool before, that we can find objects that are smaller or larger uh, based on scaling with a geometric pattern match tool. So let's set that scaling to uh, about 150%. We're still finding our original, uh, original object at about 100%, which is what it should be. 99.9% .9 has been returned. And I want to go back now to my... Uh, uh, RoboGuide simulation. We have another part. On the fixture. That I've created that's twice as tall as this uh, as this cylinder here. Uh, I, let's let's imagine if you will. That the that that what's happened is that that cylinder has gotten closer to the field of view, and there's my second cylinder that's twice as tall as the original. We'll go back to our vision process, take another picture, and here's what I want to demonstrate. The geometric pattern match has found both objects, but it's found them at different scales, as we certainly might expect. The object that's closer to the camera, object number two, has a larger scale than the originally trained object, which is the, the, at, at 100 percent. If we uh, did some further experimentation, we'd see that if we moved the object away from the field of view, this scaling would reduce and be lower than 100 percent. And that in and of itself, I hope you've, you've grasped all of that. I'm sure that you have, that in and of itself is the basis for 2.5D guidance. Um, as we think about that, I'm going to go back to our, uh, our presentation. As we think about that, we uh, certainly want to understand that things like calibration and the way you design and, and set up your application are going to be critical to making this work in the, uh, in the real world. And I'll give you some hints here as we go into this next session, next section of process uh, configuration. Okay. 
First of all, a quick review. Um, calibration is uh, really required for all IR vision processes involving guidance or measurement uh, tasks where we need real world information to tie into the uh, to the task and uh, to the application um, particularly for higher uh, accuracy we need an accurate camera calibration and the depalletizing process has some special needs first of all we have to use a perspective calibration for uh, the depalletizing process. I'm not going to go into the detail of uh, calibration in this discussion. And in fact, we had another um, uh, webinar uh, some time ago that uh, detailed uh, it went into calibration in detail. But uh, a quick review, perspective calibration is a calibration that requires two uh, planes in order to calibrate an entire perspective field of view. The result of a perspective calibration is that the camera, the camera position in space is known, the focal length of the lens becomes uh, known, and the system knows a very accurate imaging angle uh, relative to the uh, optics. And those are the things that a depalletizing process really has to have in order to be accurate in extracting that Z height. For best accuracy, these two planes, if you're familiar with perspective calibration, you define the two planes uh, and have to move uh, a, a calibration grid in those two different, uh, two, two different planes in order to complete the calibration. Those two planes used should be set to the extents of the lowest and highest possible parts to be identified. I don't recommend a single plane perspective calibration and uh, Orthogonal calibration, which is the other form of calibration uh, allowed by IR vision, is not indicated for this uh, particular process. In all cases, I would recommend an automated calibration process. So let's look at the couple of calibration processes that we're talking about here. And um, uh, really, these are what should be considered when we're looking at depalletizing. But for the general uh, for, for general purposes, I would say whenever you can, utilize one of these automated calibration processes. First of all, automated grid frame setting. The task of doing automated grid frame setting is to set a user frame from a calibration grid through an automated utility that's found in the uh, Teach Pendant menu under IR Vision Vision Utilities. We can, use, we can do automated grid frame setting for either a fixed or a robot mounted camera. And uh, of course, if we use a fixed camera, the, uh, uh, the uh, grid is going to be defined as a tool, uh, tool frame. If we use a robot mounted camera, the grid will be defined as a uh, fixed frame or a user frame. Uh, in, order, in, in, in the setting of a grid, or the setting of any user tool frame, uh, automated grid frame setting is much more accurate. It has the ability uh, through looking at the through the camera, looking at the grid itself, and going through a variety of kinematic moves uh, to define that frame much better than you can uh, using manual grid frame setting. You can really use this in any situation where you need an accurate user frame, not just related to IR vision. So. Um, even if you don't have IR vision involved, IR vision involved with the application, you can put an external USB camera that's available through FANUC right on the teach pendant and attach it to the robot temporarily or fix mount it temporarily and use that for your uh, automated grid frame setting. And usually uh, the grid frame in IR vision is used for perspective calibration. We have one other uh, automated process for uh, calibration. Uh, and that's called robot generated grid calibration. This is a semi automated process um, used to perform accurate calibration using the robot to manipulate a target. We don't need a grid to do uh, robot generated grid calibration, it creates its own grid from the target. Uh, we use this a lot, and it's uh, also documented to be very beneficial when large fields of view are used, but um, we find it can be used in almost all cases or when space permits. Uh, we've used it with smaller robots uh, and um, in tight 
tight conditions and even very tight fields of view. And it, it is a very successful way to get a highly accurate calibration in many cases. It is limited to only fixed mount camera application applications. And one of the great benefits is that it creates a calibration teach pendant program that can be easily reused without operator training. Let's say the fork truck crashes into that camera stand. All we need to do is replace the camera stand and replace or re uh, reposition the camera uh, loosely. And as long as the, uh, uh, the calibration TP program moves the target grid, target in front of the camera, uh, all we have to do is rerun the teach pendant program. And that could be done uh, by an operator or through a, uh, a run menu on your uh, HMI screen. I guess another side issue that I usually point out with robot generated grid calibration is it does deliver a very highly accurate tool center point that's represented that represents the center of the target. So sometimes when you have the target on your uh, end of arm tooling, that gives you a pretty accurate, uh, I should say very accurate uh, tool center point that you could use even in your applications. So the bottom line is, uh, please do use automated uh, calibration in as many cases as you can, and particularly when we're talking about uh, de the depalletizing process, uh, one of these automated calibration processes is uh, absolutely indicated. So before we go into some of the details of setting this process up, let's uh, talk about uh, the application analysis when you're thinking about using a depalletizing process in, in any circumstance, whether it is actually for depalletizing or for some other uses, uh, and some design hints as, as, you, uh, as you get ready to uh, use this and select it for a specific application. As uh, with any of our ordinary, and not just our ordinary, but in machine vision, with any ordinary two-dimensional uh, compensation or two-dimensional guidance, it's assumed that the object does not tilt with respect to the camera or offset frame. Certainly in simple 2D guidance, we can uh, use uh, uh, aspect ratio and scaling to locate a tilted object. However, uh, when an object is tilted relative to the camera offset frame, the imaging does produce a slightly different uh, feature set, and the resulting uh, guidance positions will just plain not be as accurate. Not because of the accuracy of the uh, algorithms, but because of the repeatability of the imaging. When it comes to uh, depalletizing, that's in, uh, or, or using uh, our depalletizing process for 2.5D uh, guidance, height guidance in, in, in addition to 2D guidance. This is critical because we rely on, we have to rely on the scaling of the object and the correct reporting of the scaling. So the second point addresses that as well. The object features to be located have to be mostly rigid and repeatable. By rigid, I mean we can't look at objects that have the possibility, uh, uh, for our locators, uh, that have the possibility of changing from part to part to part, at least, uh, and not changing very much. Certainly, we can find those objects by increasing our scale, increasing things like aspect ratio and our GPM and, uh, and other uh, parameters within our GPM, but uh, those will introduce inaccuracy in the reporting of the scaling. So we're depending on the objects to be rigid and repeatable for each part that's going to be inspected for that given process. If you have other, obje other, other objects, of course, that need to be picked, uh, address those in a separate, uh, a separate process. But always, we want the features to be located rigid and repeatable. Um, the camera position is a little bit of a trick in, in depalletizing per se. Um, maybe you're not going to do depalletizing with this uh, process, just 2.5D guidance. But if you are doing depalletizing, the real trick uh, in some cases is to uh, accommodate all of the variation in heights relative to the multiple layers that you're going to image. That um, can be difficult. Sometimes the camera has to be a little bit higher than we hope. Um, we do want to minimize the camera distance where possible because that uh, improves the, uh, the accuracy of the Z height reporting. And if you're using a robot-mounted camera, you can 
change the camera height and the depalletizing process takes uh, takes that into account and it's reporting just as it would if it were a standard 2D uh, 2D uh, guidance application. A quick word about minimizing the camera distance. Why is that kind of important and what's the techno technological limitation behind that? The thing is that as you get a ha camera higher and higher and higher above a part, the uh, in order to uh, keep the same field of view, you're typically reducing, or excuse me, typically increasing the focal length of the lens and reducing the image angle of the lens. Uh, the depalletizing process, just by its nature of, rec of uh, analyzing scaling based on uh, image angle, does best when the image angle is a little bit larger. So uh, lower focal length lenses uh, tend to give uh, better accuracy in a 2.5D application. The camera, again, as with most of our, with all of our processes, should be normal to the offset frame, but it's more important with the depalletizing process, again, due to the scaling issues that uh, we want to get the best possible accuracy and scaling we can, and that's going to come when the camera is normal to the offset frame. Lighting, as always, can be a challenge, uh, and this even more so if you have a whole bunch of layers where we have to get uniform lighting on uh, layers uh, uh, over a, a, a very deep distance from top to bottom. Generally, for depalletizing and for two and a half D, uh, a two and a half D uh, guidance uh, result, we'd like to see the scale variation in the objects to be greater than about 5%. That's not to say that we can't get a pretty good result even if the scaling uh, is uh, smaller. Um, and, of course, this is relative to your field of view. If you have very small objects that only change height uh, by a, a very small amount, you're li it's likely you're going to use a smaller field of view, and still then the scale variation will be uh, a, re a reasonable percentage. But uh, it's, this is a good rule of thumb just to consider as you're designing. And finally, as with any application where you're going to do varying heights, uh, like depalletizing, bin picking, uh, all of those types of applications where we have uh, parts with varying heights. Uh, it's important to take some precautions in gripper design and certainly in your robot programming to uh, accommodate suitable compliance. Uh, we want to accommodate all possibilities, all danger situations, and use things like skip functions, uh, skip recovery uh, to, to uh, recover, collision recovery to recover from possible collision situations. So let's move right on then to discussing the actual configuration of a depalletizing process or a two and a half D process. The general steps in the configuration are to first of all make sure our cameras are accurately calibrated, and I've gone over that uh, that concept. I won't go into the actual calibration of the cameras in RoboGuide in this uh, in this demonstration. We've already set an appropriate offset frame. We know it's uh, we know it's accurate, and uh, particularly in terms of its height relative to the uh, world frame, and this is the this is the user frame we're going to use for offset. Then we're going to create, teach, and configure a vision process, and ultimately create and teach the robot program. So let's get started by going back to our uh, RoboGuide program. And I'll switch through the uh, switch through the uh, different screens here. And uh, at the, for right now, I'm going to stick with these cylindrical parts just as a demonstration of getting a, a depalletizing a program configured. I'm going to go to our um, uh, vision setup main screen, and I have a, uh, a depalletizing process already created called scale test. And let's edit that process uh, so we can discuss the, uh, uh, the depalletizing setup a little bit further. So as you can see here, I've created, I previously created a, a depalletizing vision process. It automatically comes up with a GPM locator tool as its main parent tool. Of course, you can use child tools as part of that if necessary for your particular process to modify and uh, uh, 
constrain the results of the uh, parent GPM locator tool. I, sh I would note that the only tool available in the depa the only parent tool available in the depalletizing vision process is the GPM locator tool, simply because it's the only tool that provides a suitable scaling factor to be used with things like two and a half D guidance. I've selected again my camera one calibration, which has previously been calibrated. Uh, in simulation using uh, a robot generated grid cal and let's move down to um, the exposure and uh, other uh, modes re related to the camera of course this this isn't as uh, important in my simulation, but these will be important issues as you move forward in uh, setting up your camera for um, for the depalletizing process, particularly as we said, in layered parts. Certainly setting exposure time uh, uh, and uh, deciding whether you're going to use a fixed or automated exposure or even multi-exposures to get a more consistent image over the varying layers. So that takes us uh, really to the point where we want to uh, talk about creating the uh, creating and training the command tool the GPM locator tool so I'm going to go right to that tool and I think this is going to be a review for almost all of you but let's just look at it uh, and uh, in in process and I'm going to um, discuss uh, discuss some of these uh, the particulars of getting this tool uh, functioning as you saw before uh, in my in the uh, in the other example, uh, I've taught a 2D, uh, excuse me, I've taught a GPM locator on the uh, smaller, uh, on the smaller of the two, or the, 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 the lowest level of the two objects. And I guess, by the way, let me go in here and I'm going to uh, hide that, um, that larger object so that I'm only looking at the smallest object. So let's go ahead and reteach that in this process. I have a circle all the way around it, or a, a window already around that, and I'm going to mask, as we did just a moment ago, mask out the uh, portions of that uh, portions of that view that are uh, not uh, important to, and actually would disrupt our uh, a successful find in this case. We'll do a snap and find, and we see that we did indeed get a, a locate of that object uh, with good score. We expect it to be a good score because it's, of course, simulation and uh, a scaling of 100%, which is what we would expect for our initial trained object. Usually that initial trained object is the lowest object in the stack if, if we're working with an actual depalletizing process. Uh, as you know from your GPM experience, we can manipulate the score, manipulate the threshold. Uh, Area overlap may be important, likely will not be important for your applications, but if you have some closely spaced graphics, it may come into play. Uh, elasticity. I would make one more comment uh, that um, when I'm working with a cylinder like this, we won't go into this right now, that's a, something for another, uh, another discussion, but when I'm working with uh, geometric primitives like this, it may be most efficient to actually train those primitives uh, synthetically using a geometric or using a geometric editing uh, to synthetically train in this case a circle. We get a much better result when we act when we synthetically train the circle or synthetically train the object versus uh, using the image to train the object. So. Just to wrap up the discussion of the uh, GPM locator tool. Um, because it's a cylinder, I'm not going to look at uh, orientation. That that would, uh, but we'll see that in our in another example here in a moment. The most important part is though to uh, address the scaling issue. We expect because of this process, we expect this part to grow. Um, if we're training on the lowest possible object uh, in our in our stack or in our in our uh, uh, set of parts then we expect that to be about 100%. But as the objects get closer to the camera, they're going to grow significantly. And because of that, we we need to handle the scaling, usually at the top end, if we're training the bottom part, uh, at the top end of the scaling. And it usually has to be a number that's a lot more than you might normally expect with your regular 2D vision guidance applications. So I've set this for 180, and that's going to ensure that I find this small object uh, as it gets closer to the camera. Uh, 
and uh, gets bigger in the field of view. That's about it for the GPM locator tool. Let's go con conclude our discussion of setting up the vision process itself. I'm going to go right to, uh, right now, right to the reference setting. And uh, this looks a lot different from your 2D guidance setting, but it's really very, very easy to understand. We have, uh, in, in setting reference for depa uh, depalletizing or 2.5D uh, vision process, we need to set the lowest object and the highest object. And if we're working uh, to find uh, multiple layers, we need to set which, which layer those objects are going to be referenced at. So I happen to know for my training here, I have these two cylinders. This one is the lowest cylinder. The other one is twice as big. So I really have two layers. And let's start out by uh, training those. The cylinders are 250 millimeters in height. They're, they are resting on user frame one. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, since we just found this, just set this up, I would uh, set my height first, which is 250. I would set my layer next which is the first layer, and then, oops, and then set uh, the reference for this, uh, for this lower part. So this is reference height one, it's returned a scale of 100, and it's going to tell me that I'm, if I ask it to, it's going to tell me that I'm on layer one. And indeed, if we look at the data underneath, uh, we have returned a scaling of 100 for that part and a layer of 1. We're not done yet, though. Uh, this would be enough for a 2D guidance process, for, but for depalletizing 2.5D, we need to do one more step, and that is I need to uh, look at the part or look at a part at the tallest extent of the layers I'm going to process. So I'm going to take this uh, in simulation, take this small part out, and add the larger part back in. And let's snap that part. There we go. And uh, we'll just, I, I guess, actually, let's uh, uh, re reset our second reference height and layer. Uh, this one, we, uh, as I said, is twice the size of the small part, so I had already entered 500 in there. And the reference layer for this part, since it's two times higher, would probably be two. Um, if you were doing five layers, of course, you'd set the height that you expected this tallest part to be at, and you'd set five in your reference layers. So now that we've got the uh, fundamental data, we'll do a snap and find and set that as our second height reference. So we've set the lowest possible and the highest possible for this example. And we can see that it, it's returned a, a scaling equal to it, equal to what we set as a reference, and uh, it's returned a layer of two. Let's go back now. Now let's get ready to pick these parts. Um, you, we could start with the tallest part uh, in terms of setting a reference. I would, uh, in this case, oops, uh, in this case, I would prefer uh, to set the reference to the smallest part. So I'm going to put the smallest part back in front of the camera, or the smallest layer back in front of the camera. Go back, back to my uh, my uh, uh, vision process, do a snap and find, and set now my reference position. So the reference position in a depalletizing vision process, this is an advanced course, I know you're all used to 2D vision processing, the reference position is the same as you would use for any um, uh, for any 2D guidance process. We're going to get an offset back from this uh, process. It's going to include an X and Y. If I had enabled uh, 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 orientation, it would also include a roll. But in this case, it's just fixed because I didn't uh, I didn't change the uh, orient uh, change the uh, I didn't allow the GPM to return any uh, roll factor. The difference is with our uh, 2D uh, or with our two and a half D guidance process, our depalletizing process, is that we get an actual Z distance back from the process. Very unheard of. You're not used to getting Z back from a 2D guidance process, but from our 2.5D process, we get the actual Z back. Let's look at that, though, because we have some options as to how that Z comes back to us. 
I'm going to disable these two numbers, these two clicks here. And in the app Z mode parameter, we have two different selections. And the one we're going to talk about right now is calculating the Z from the found scale, because that's usually what we want to do. Um, I'll do a snap and find. And it is, it is going to return the uh, Z height. If I go back to my vision process, excuse me, my RoboKite process, and take that part and uh, stretch it just a little bit, move it uh, up a little bit in the, in the field of view, and go back and snap and find again, we see that it's returning a new Z height. And we can use that Z height with, with a, very, a very high uh, degree of reliability uh, for our pick process. Now, let me put my part back to its original height uh, lay, sitting on the palette as if it were the first layer in a palette, or in a, in a uh, depalletizing process. Snap and find, it shall return 250 again. It makes uh, it sometimes much more convenient, especially if you're actually doing depalletizing, to just snap to the layer height. And what that does is it returns in our vision register the layer that we want to move to. It, you also still get the Z, uh, the Z height from this process in, in your vision register, but it will automatically tell you which layer it believes that part is on. And you can even output that if you need to in a, uh, in a uh, measurement, in the measurement uh, uh, part of the vision register as well. So depending on how you'd like to architect your application, you can get either just the Z height or both the Z height and the calculated layer for a simple pick to a given layer. Uh, a given layer. You can also use that number again in the uh, if you if you um, uh, look at the measurement uh, data coming back. You could use that number as kind of a sanity check to be sure that uh, the layer that's being returned by the vision is the layer that you think uh, you're going to have to go to next. Let's do one more thing. I'm going to re-enable or re redisplay uh, this taller uh, object, simulating perhaps that we have uh, an object here that's uh, the first layer and, an, uh, and two objects stacked on each other that are the, uh, the double layer. And we can see that the system has returned uh, the correct layers and the correct Z heights. Now, um, the, with the precision that it's returning the Z height in my simulation is, is going to be almost, uh, well, in this case, it's perfect, usually is very close to perfect in simulation. But I can, I can tell you from experience that I think that you're going to get, um, from a layer point of view, this procedure is uh, absolutely bulletproof in returning the correct layer to be picking from. In terms of Z height resolution, of course it depends on the field of view, depends on the imaging angle as we discussed, but we do get a very uh, precise, very, a, a very accurate Z height out of this, and I think for applications like this with normal size palettes, we might say it's even within, easily within uh, a few or several millimeters of uh, being a very, uh, of being the actual accurate height of the object. So that's where a little bit of gripper compliance comes in, but um, in general, that's uh, more than enough for uh, most depalletizing and uh, for many of your 2.5D applications where you simply want to discover height. So now that we've set up the uh, just this, uh, two, uh, this uh, guidance process, we want to talk about, um, I'd like to talk about uh, the, uh, a full-blown depalletizing application. I'm going to get rid of my cylinders, my test cylinders here, and bring up something that looks a little bit more familiar, which is some boxes. Let's say we have a, gr a bunch of boxes on this pallet and we'd like to depalletize them. I've already set up a depalletizing program which uses the uh, FANUC logo on the boxes, and I'll just show you that briefly. So that's already calibrated to be uh, the first layer, as we can see right here.
uh, also at a Z height of 250, and it's finding FANUC as the rigid uh, feature that it's going to use for the scaling, uh, uh, the scaling application. Uh, we won't go into that any further. I think we've uh, we've covered that in detail. But let's see it actually in action. And uh, I'll get some boxes out here. And then before we run it, I want to show you the uh, the Teach Pendant program. It's I think it'll be familiar to most of you. So to get some more boxes on that palette, I'm going to use a very nice feature of RoboGuide uh, to just place parts on the palette. I'd like uh, them to be in an array of two by two x, uh, two in the x direction, two in the y direction, three in the z direction. Uh, we can set the locations of those boxes. I've already got it preset to exactly match the box size so that they kind of butt up against each other and that they stack uh, perfectly in the in the height uh, that the uh, the height of the box, which is 250 millimeters. So let's just put that together, and there we have a nice stack of a nice two by two stack that's three high of our FANUC boxes. Let's take this opportunity then to go to our Teach Pendant and talk just for a moment about the actual uh, Teach Pendant program. I think, again, you're going to see that this is a very uh, familiar program to everybody because it runs just the same as any 2D guidance uh, program. We, use, we uh, run the uh, DPAL-1 uh, vision process. We get the offset into a vision register. And as we often would do, we use that vision off that vision register as a offset to a trained pick point, and a tool offset as an approach. In this case, um, the actual pick point is right here, which was which is just the vision offset. The difference here is in the depalletizing two and a half D process that it all, the vision register also contains a Z that changes from layer to layer to layer. You know in your 2D process that Z is fixed. It's fixed when you set the reference. In our depalletizing process, the Z changes from offset to offset. Um, a couple of other things. The SIM, the SIM uh, pick and the SIM place are just uh, part of the RoboGuide simulation to allow some movement, as you're going to see in a moment. And that's all there is to the process. We get a, we do a find, get an offset. Um, we could find more than one part at a time. I'm only finding one part at a time, so I need to do a run find for every part that gets picked. You could try to find, or not try, you could, um, depending on your application, find more than one part of a, a given layer and go and pick them all with, do it without doing another image acquisition if, you, if, if, if it worked for your application. So that's it. It's a very simple process. Let's run that process. I'm going to close this window. Um, and make sure I, let's go, I want to go back to my teach pendant and just make sure that that pr main program is selected, which it is, and we can run our uh, our process. Let's get rid of those TCP traces. So what you see is the camera taking a picture at every every pick, and the robot going to the uh, the correct part. Uh, the sorting of these parts in terms of which part gets picked first on a layer is, is within control in the process, or you could um, also get measurement data output that you could use that in your TP program to manipulate which part, which box actually got picked if you had a full layer. The robot will go to the top of each of the, each of the boxes in the layer as it finds them. Oh, and I want to show, I'm sorry, I want to show the uh, runtime screen over here to the upper right, uh, we can see the scaling uh, uh, information and the layer information that's coming back from each of the images as the images are processed. And finally, we're down to uh, layer number one. It's going to finish picking that layer. And within a very very short amount of time, uh, we are uh, we are picking boxes using uh, the depalletizing process, and it, I hope that you can see that it's a very powerful process and one that's in, indeed, even though it's powerful, very easy to set up, very easy to configure. Let's go back to our um, uh, to close out our presentation for the day. I'd just like to discuss a couple more of these application capabilities that I've kind of suggested as we're going through this demonstration. 
one of the big use, one of the real key uses of the depalletizing process is to use it just in a 2D guidance application when you have, when you want to address parts, uh, single parts, not stacked parts, but just single parts that may have Z height variation. Um, Many times we'll find situations where uh, a given part, a given feature, or even a given feature on a part may be in a slightly different Z height to the extent that, as you already should know, uh, if you provide a fi when you provide the fixed Z height in the 2D process, if the part's not really at that fixed Z height, the perspective calibration and the, and the, uh, the search process has the potential for returning a slightly inaccurate uh, XY position because the Z height has changed relative to your, um, relative to your fixed uh, definition. We don't have to do that with the depalletizing process. Uh, because in the depalletizing process, we can use a register and send in the and send into the process uh, the expected Z height for any given search. So and and it will correctly uh, correctly reconfigure the uh, the perspective calibration to return the perspective calibration at the plane relative to the Z height that you've specified in the register. I'll take just a moment to show you that uh, to show you that in my uh, uh, sample uh, my sample here. I'm sorry, I picked the wrong one. I go back to here. Okay, uh, that's once again in the app Z mode, and instead of having the system calculate, you can have the depalletizing process use a register that you send in. So let's say in register 10, I'm going to provide the depalletizing process the exact height of the object I want to I want to uh, guide, I want to inspect, and that in that way we can be using we can use this process to inspect. Now it does have to be the same object, of course. It can't be varying objects, uh, but we uh, but if we have the same object at varying heights, we can use one vision process and simply pass in our register and get still get very very accurate height uh, and and x y and height information x y information from the uh, depalletizing process. Real powerful tool. I notice that a lot of people and sometimes sometimes use uh, what's called a floating frame technique to do depalletize or depalletizing or even to do these variations in um, uh, z height with a 2D guidance uh, application. Uh, that's not necessary and really not well, not really indicated. It's not a good technique to use for these processes. The better choice would be to use a depalletizing process uh, to uh, to change the z height of the locate when is necessary in your application. And then finally, as I've been again suggesting through the discussion, this is quite literally a two and a half D guidance application. You don't have to be doing depalletizing to do to use this this process to discover the z height of an object and in that in in doing that you can get for uh, you can imagine this is in any even singulated project uh, singulated uh, product or singulated object uh, guidance application you can get not only the x y and the uh, rotation of that object you can also get the Z height of the object with, uh, again, as I've, as I've pointed out, very realistic uh, precision and accuracy for many applications. So you don't need to limit yourself to the word depalletizing when we think about this process, even though it's extremely powerful for true depalletizing that needs vision guidance, you don't need to limit yourself to that word. Let's think of it as 2.5D guidance and imagine the many ways you could use this successfully in your more advanced applications.